Well, good morning, everybody. If you would find your seat you know, next to somebody you love. going to be going to Deuteronomy chapter 32 this morning. If you want to turn there and your copy of God's Word, Deuteronomy chapter 32. This is... uh, significant song that is written in scripture. It's the second one that Moses himself has written. And songs are written down for instruction. They're a teaching tool. So you would expect that this song being used as a teaching tool that you're going to hear it throughout the rest of the Bible. You're going to hear parts of it, echoes of it, people following the logic of exactly this chapter. It, parts of it fall in line with Scripture that comes before, such as Leviticus 26, an important prophetic passage on the blessings and curses and restoration of Israel. Parts of this passage tie into Isaiah 40 to 48. I call those the the big God chapters of the Bible. That's where you read about those statements like, I am God and there is no other. Uh, There's salvation to be found in Him and no one else. Those are statements that come from Deuteronomy 32. They're expounded on in Isaiah 40 to 48. In the New Testament, When you get into Romans 9 through 15, you have a lot of the same logic that's repeated and carried on. There's elements of this song also within the book of Revelation. Alora, you're seriously not going to sit with them? You're going to sit? Okay. (laughs) Uh, What's in the. Oh, 1 Corinthians. 10, where uh, Paul talks about how Christ was the rock who guided Israel through the wilderness. He goes back to this chapter and follows the logic of it. So we're going to read this whole song together, and then we're going to pray and then discuss it. So beginning Deuteronomy Chapter 32, which actually begins in the end of 31. So I'm actually starting in 3130. 3130. Then Moses spoke in the hearing of all the assembly of Israel the words of this song until they were complete. Give ear, O heavens, and let them speak, and let the earth hear the words of my mouth. Let what I have learned drop as the rain. My speech distill as the dew, as the droplets on the fresh grass, and as the showers on the herb. For I proclaim the name of Yahweh, ascribe greatness to our God, the rock. His work is perfect, for all his ways are just, a God of faithfulness and without injustice. Righteousness and upright is he. They have acted corruptly toward him. They are not his children because of their defect, but they are a perverse and crooked generation. Do you thus repay Yahweh, O people who are wickedly foolish and without wisdom? Is not he your father who has bought you? He has made you and established you. Remember the ancient days. Consider the years from generation to generation. Ask your father and he will declare to you, your elders, and they will speak to you. 
when the Most High gave the nations their inheritance, when he separated the sons of men, he set the boundaries of the peoples according to the number of the sons of Israel. For Yahweh's portion is his people. Jacob is the allotment of his inheritance. He found him in a desert land and in the howling waste of a wilderness. He encircled him. He cared for him. He guarded him as the pupil of his eye. Like an eagle that stirs up its nest that hovers over its young, he spread his wings and caught them. He carried them on his pinions. Yahweh alone guided him. And there was no foreign god with him. He made him ride on the high places of the earth, and he ate the produce of the field, and he made him suck honey from the rock and oil from the flinty rock, curds of cows and milk of the flock with fat of lambs and rams, the breed of Bashan and goats with the finest of the wheat and of the blood of grapes you drank wine. But Jeshurun grew fat and kicked. You grew fat, thick, and sleek. Then he abandoned God who made him and treated the rock of his salvation with wicked foolishness. They made him jealous with strange gods. With abominations, they provoked him to anger. They sacrificed to demons who were not God, to gods whom they have not known, new gods who came lately, whom your fathers did not dread. You neglected the rock who begot you and forgot the God who brought you forth. And Yahweh saw this and spurned them because of the provocation of his sons and daughters Then he said, I will hide my face from them. I will see what their end shall be. For they are a perverse generation, sons in whom is no faithfulness. They have made me jealous with what is not God. They have provoked me to anger with their idols. So I will make them jealous with those who are not a people. I will provoke them to anger with a wickedly foolish nation. For a fire is kindled in my anger, and it burns to the lowest parts of Sheol, and it consumes the earth with its produce, and it sets on fire the foundations of the mountains. I will heap calamities on them. I will exhaust my arrows on them. They will be wasted by famine and consumed by plague and bitter destruction. And the teeth of beast I will send upon them. With the venom of crawling things of the dust, outside the sword will bereave and inside terror, both choice man and virgin, the nursing baby with the man of gray hair. I would have said, I will cut them to pieces. I will cause the memory of them to cease from men, had I not feared the provocation by the enemy, lest their adversaries misjudge, lest they say, our hand is triumphant and Yahweh has not done all this, for they are a nation where counsel perishes, and there is no discernment in them. Would that they were wise, that they had insight into this, that they would understand their future. How could one pursue 1,000 and two put 10,000 to flight unless their rock had sold them and Yahweh handed them over? Indeed, their rock is not like Our rock. Even our enemies themselves judge this. For their vine is from the vine of Sodom and from the fields of Gomorrah. Their grapes are grapes of poison, their clusters bitter. Their wine is the venom of serpents and the deadly poison of cobras. Is it not laid up in store with me, sealed up in my treasuries? Vengeance is mine and retribution. In due time, their foot will stumble. For the day of their disaster is near, and the impending things are hastening upon them. For Yahweh will render justice to his people and will have compassion on his slaves. When he sees that their strength is gone and there is none remaining, bond or free, and he will say, Where are their gods, the rock in which they sought refuge, 
who ate the fat of their sacrifices and drank the wine of their drink offering. Let them rise up and help you. Let them be your hiding place. See now that I, I am he, and there is no God besides me. It is I who put to death and give life. I have wounded, and it is I who heal. And there is no one who can deliver from my hand. Indeed, I lift up my hand to heaven and say, as I live forever, if I sharpen my flashing sword and my hand takes hold on judgment, I will render vengeance on my adversaries, and I will repay those who hate me. I will make my arrows drunk with blood, and my sword will devour flesh with the blood of the slain and the captives from the long-haired leaders of the enemy. O nations, cause his people to shout for joy, for he will avenge the blood of his slaves, and he will render vengeance on his adversaries, and he will atone for his land and his people." Then Moses came and spoke all the words of this song in the hearing of the people, he and Joshua, the son of Nun. Then Moses finished speaking all these words to all Israel, and he said to them, Place in your heart all the words with which I am warning you today, which you shall command your sons to be careful to do, even all the words of this law. For it is not an idle word for you. Indeed, it is your life. And by this word, you will prolong your days in the land which you are about to cross the Jordan to possess. And Yahweh spoke to Moses that very same day, saying, Go up to this mountain of the Abarim, Mount Nebo, which is in the land of Moab, opposite Jericho, and look at the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the sons of Israel for a possession." Then die on the mountain where you ascend, and be gathered to your people, as Aaron your brother died on Mount Hor and was gathered to his people, because you both acted unfaithfully with me. In the midst of the sons of Israel, at the waters of Meribah Kadesh, in the wilderness of Zin, because you both did not treat me as holy in the midst of the sons of Israel, For you shall see the land at a distance, but you shall not go there into the land which I am giving the sons of Israel. Let's pray. Our gracious Lord, we thank you for this song, for these words which were instructive to Israel in generations past and instructive even to us today as we await the full fulfillment of the things of which it speaks of. We pray that you would give us insight into this text, that your spirit would illuminate it, that we would appreciate it, rightly understand it, and that our hearts would be lifted up to worship you as you have revealed yourself in your word. We pray this morning that you would teach us, that you would bless our fellowship in you and grow and mature our worship of you. Amen. This song that we read is long. Have you ever learned a song that that's, that's that long? It doesn't even have a, a chorus. It's just one verse. <laughs> I guess you could divide it up into to several verses, but there's not a lot of repetition in it. And as, as I've labeled it, it's, it's Moses' rock song. Why do you think I referred to it as Moses' rock song? Yeah, it's, it, the rock is a, a title for God. When we think of, you know, titles for God, you might think of like Jesus being the shepherd or the the lion of Judah, you know, things like this. But 
one of the most used titles of God in Scripture is the rock. He's referred to as the rock, and there's teaching and concepts, ideas that come along with that. What you think about a, a rock, it's a safe place. If you're inside of a cave, which caves are made out of rocks, you can be protected there. So that's one of the things. When you read the word rock, you'll read about how God protected Israel in the wilderness. Uh, he was their hiding place. Uh, you also read about how the rock provided for Israel. Can you think of where God, through a rock, provided for Israel? Meribah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, two, two times, you know, there is a rock from which living waters flowed. And so you will read about God's provision and talking about how he also provided uh, the manna from heaven. You also read about uh, his guidance. And you see that in verse 12, actually. It says, Yahweh alone guided him. You know, the rock was the one who guided them. And you look at, you can tie verse 4 and verse 12 together. If you look at verse 4, it says, you know, the rock, his work is perfect for all his ways are just, a God of faithfulness and without injustice. And it's like, well, what did the rock do? What did this faithful rock do? Well, in verse 12, Yahweh alone guided him and there was no foreign God with him. The apostle Paul teaching from this particular song in 1 Corinthians 10. I want you to look over there and see this, 1 Corinthians 10. You know, keep your place in Deuteronomy 32. We'll kind of be looking back and forth here. I'll we'll start in the beginning of the chapter. It says, For we do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea, and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and all ate the same spiritual food, and all drank the same spiritual drink, for they were drinking from a spiritual rock which followed them, and the rock was Christ. Now, some people look at this passage and say, you see it there? You can allegorize the Bible because Paul did. You can spiritualize certain texts because that's what Paul did because Moses never taught that Yahweh was the rock. <laughs> but when you go back and you read this song that Paul, Paul had learned this song, he knew Deuteronomy 32. He's actually teaching from it in 1 Corinthians 10. And you read it. God's called the rock, he's a God of faithfulness, and he's the one who guided them. So what Paul is doing is he's not allegorizing or spiritualizing a text, he's just giving the exact same meaning. He's not giving it a new meaning, but he is uh, applying it in a way to see how history has developed into Christ and his provision. So you would expect to hear things about temptation to be reminded that God is faithful. So look at verse 13. This is 1 Corinthians 10, 13. No temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will provide the way of escape so that you will be able to endure it. So yeah, this is something that also comes from Deuteronomy chapter 32 as he goes on following that logic there's actually a, a direct quote in verse 20 you might have it in small caps in your bible he says no but i say let the things which the gentiles sacrifice they sacrifice to demons and not to god that's a quotation from deuteronomy 32 he says i don't want you to be sharers and demons so if you go back into deuteronomy 32 you read back in verse 17 there, 
It says they sacrificed to demons who were not God, to gods whom they have not known, new gods who came lately. So Paul, who's kind of like the New Testament Moses in a way, like one of the primary teachers of the new covenant goes back to Moses's rock song and instructs the New Testament church and how God is still that. He's, he's still our rock and we're not to be unfaithful to him like Israel was. When you look back at that time during Moses and how they responded to God, you know, see, God has given us new hearts that, that we would be faithful to him and that we would be able to endure temptation, that we shouldn't turn you know, back to false gods, but to be basically the undoing of the testimony of Deuteronomy 32, which it tells of God's faithfulness and Israel's unfaithfulness. He says, but now because Christ has come, who is our rock, who has brought us the salvation we needed, now we be faithful to him. It's God's faithfulness and our faithfulness to our faithful God. And I think you heard when we read through Deuteronomy 32, you hear these tensions between Israel's unfaithfulness and the rock's faithfulness. Uh, God's character, verse 4, it, his work is perfect. His ways are just. He's a God of faithfulness. He's without injustice, righteous and upright is he. This was teaching Israel about the character of God, but it was also teaching them about their own character. So you keep going on to verse 5. It says, in contrast to him, they have acted corruptly toward him. They are not his children because of their defect, but are a perverse and crooked generation. So now he's dividing out. There's people in Israel who believe. We refer to them as the remnant, as the prophets do. But there's also this larger group that is a perverse and crooked generation, which Jesus quotes this. Remember, there was the guy who had a son who had seizures and suffered and would fall into the fire, and Jesus healed him. And there were these ones who would not believe that he was the rock who would provide that kind of salvation. And Jesus responds in Matthew 17, 17, he says, Oh, you unbelieving and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring him here to me. And then he does what is right and provides a salvation for this child. But within this song, you also would have the faithful singing it. You know, every, everybody in the congregation singing it, the congregation of Israel, that is, the faithful and the, the unfaithful. You hear that in verse 6, you know, do you thus repay Yahweh? You know, they're talking to the crooked and perverse among them. O people who are wickedly foolish and without wisdom, is not he your father who has brought you? He has made you and established you. It's like, why are you even a nation? Why are you even here? Uh, why do you even have you know, a Bible? Why do you even have instruction from God? It says, remember the ancient days, consider the years from generation to generation. Ask your father and he'll declare to you. You remember how God told, taught their fathers to teach their children and to pass it on from generation to generation? And he helped them, he gave them a song to help them to continue to do that. It says, your elders and they'll speak to you. And to remind them, when the Most High gave the nations their inheritance, when he separated the sons of man or the sons of Adam, he set the boundaries of the peoples according to the number of the sons of Israel. Can you think of a time when Paul taught from this passage right here? In Acts 17, 17. He talks about how God has uh, created man. He made man to live in certain boundaries and history. Paul knew Deuteronomy 32. He had learned the song and he, he taught from it often. 
Uh, verse 9, for Yahweh's portion is his people. Jacob is the allotment of his inheritance. So the faithful would sing this. God alone created them, but he also created all the nations. And he created time and the boundaries in which every single person would live. And he sustains them. But when it comes to Israel, there's something of their uniqueness in which they're allotted to him as his chosen, his inheritance, his kingdom of priests to be the, na the nation that is a blessing to other, the other nations. Now, was this because they were so amazing and lovable and numerous and wise and effective? Yeah, they, they weren't the best choice if that's what you were looking for, right? So we can say, you know, why, why was Israel chosen or elected by God? And I say, well, because he chose to do it that way, to magnify his name and what his love is like, even toward a stubborn and stiff-necked people. This is why in theology we say God's election is an unconditional election. Uh, they didn't have to meet certain conditions to become the chosen. They didn't have to meet certain conditions in order to become the elect. It's something that God sovereignly chose in and of himself. And God is the one who made from one man every nation of mankind to inhabit all the face of the earth, having determined their appointed times and the boundaries of their habitation, but for a purpose. You know, why did God do all these things? As Paul preaches in Acts 17, that they would seek God, if perhaps they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. When you look at uh, verses 10 through 12, you read about how Israel was in the wilderness and he cared for them. He guarded them as the pupil of his eye or the, the apple of his eye, the one in, uh, who, whom he, he loved, who had captured his gaze because he had decided to set it upon them by his grace. And you hear the eagle word in verse 11, you know, like an eagle. He ties into these ideas of not only protecting them, but also delivering them, going back to the preamble of Israel's constitution in Exodus chapter 19, when he describes what they would be as a nation, but ultimately they would be a people who would be known for being delivered on the eagle wings of Yahweh himself. And it talks about his, you know, why were they able to, to eat? Why did they enjoy honey, milk, wine, these sort of things? It was because God was gracious to them. It wasn't because they earned it or deserved it, but because by grace he chose to gift them with these things. And you read there in verses 13 to 14, which I'm, Referring to the honey, milk, uh, wheat, wine, all these sort of things, that it was Israel's initial enjoyment of the promised land. They had a foretaste of it. But was that enough to make them? love God or to choose to belong to him, uh, experiencing his kindness. And those, I guess you could say, horizontal things. You know, they had a horizontal blessing and enjoying things that God created. And, but that didn't, bring them to necessarily all having this vertical relationship with God by being made right with him. Uh, you could say that they bit the hand that fed them. You start to see that in verse 15. It says, but Jeshurun grew fat 
and kicked. You grew fat, thick, and sleek. Then he abandoned God who made him and treated the rock of his salvation with wicked foolishness. Who is Jeshurun? Yeah, Israel. You might have a footnote there in your Bible, say something like it's, it's a poetic name for Israel. It's a, a word that can be translated as upright. It's also used to talk about a straight or smooth path when you get into Isaiah 40. Yeah, it talks about there's this one who's prepared in the wilderness to make straight or to make smooth the way of the Lord. It's this word. And it's, it's the, up, the upright people. It's the smooth path people. These are the narrow path people. That's how God described them. I think it's saying uh, this was designating their ideal character, not their actual character, but their ideal character. It's who they were supposed to be. And you see him calling them, he's calling them Jeshurun, you know, the upright ones. The Jews, when they translated this into Greek, they use agape menos, which means beloved or the loved ones. But it talks about, you know, but, you know, God's upright beloved one grew fat and kicked. They grew fat and thick and sleek, which is, I mean, you, you think about growing fat, you're like, that's a bad thing. <laughs> this was a good thing. This was a good thing. It was the idea of uh, richness, being uh, well fed, uh, being wealthy. But in that, they forgot the God who gave them all of those blessings and they abandoned him and just enjoyed the gifts. And enjoying the gifts, they forgot about the giver and they treated the rock with wicked foolishness. It didn't make any sense to turn against God. It made, made all sorts of sense to say thanks to him, to be devoted to him, to live for him, to honor him. But in wicked foolishness, they turned away from him. You look in verse 16, it says, They made him jealous with strange gods, with abominations. They provoked him to anger. They sacrificed to demons who were not God, to gods whom they have not known, new gods who came lately, whom your fathers did not dread. You neglected the rock who begot you and forgot the God who brought you forth. Not only were they apathetic, they were rebellious. Uh, they didn't just forget because there was no testimony of God. It wasn't a passive sort of thing. But that word forget has you know, more the idea of a, a, a willful apathy. They just didn't want to think about him. They did not want to remember him. They were far more fascinated with the gods that they learned about in Egypt. Uh, they didn't want to leave them. They, they couldn't see ever just totally cutting off the wisdom of those gods and just belonging to the God of wisdom. Uh, they could never in their mind separate how they would think about agriculture from Baal, which that's a, that's a word that means husband. Uh, you probably hear it pronounced Baal. Uh, I, I pronounce it Baal, <laughs> Baal, Baal. It's the same false god. Uh, it means husband, which you can see the betrayal in that, in which when Israel didn't uh, get the sort of produce from their crops that they wanted, they said, well, Yahweh, we're going to go to our husband, the one who actually provides for us. But in that, they were very deceived and had forgotten the God who begot them. And their blindness continued even in the face of God's wrath. You know, like in verse 19, it says, Yahweh saw and spurned. And he saw exactly what they were like. And it didn't, he didn't say, 
And I just want you guys to know that I love you and I have a wonderful plan for your life. And he says, well, he was provoked by his sons and daughters. And he said, I will hide my face from them. I will see what will be their end for they are a perverse generation, sons in whom is no faithfulness. And hey, listen for this word play on jealousy here. It says, they have made me jealous with what is not God. They have provoked me to anger with their idols. So he says, so I will make them jealous with those who are not a people. So who are the people who are not a people? Yeah, that's the Gentiles, the other nations who had not been set apart to being holy to God. And Paul picks up on this part of the song in Romans ten nineteen. He says, you know, but, but I say, did Israel not know? First Moses says, well, this, to give you a little bit of context, this is about, you know, how, how will they hear unless a preacher has been sent? Which we usually talk about that and like, we need to send missionaries. But you know, Paul is asking this question and saying, well, how, how will they hear unless a preacher is sent? He says, a preacher has been sent. They don't have any excuse. That's how he's using that phrase. A preacher has been sent to Israel. They don't have any excuse. He says, but I say, did Israel not know? And then he quotes from what we just read. He says, first Moses says, I will make you jealous by that which is not a nation. By a nation without understanding, I will anger you. Because they're going to see the blessing that they would think of as belonging to them going to the Gentiles. I think, but God promised that to us. He's like, exactly. He did that to make them angry, to make them jealous so that they would go and pursue it. He says, I will provoke them to anger with a wickedly foolish nation. As for a fire is kindled in my anger and it burns to the lowest part of Sheol and it consumes the earth with its produce and it sets on fire the foundations of the mountains. So what God speaks of is removing Israel's power from them later on in order to remove them from their idolatry. I think we're going to pick up in verse 35 where you see that. This is a verse that you'll, you'll know. It says, Vengeance is mine and retribution. In due time their foot will stumble for the day of their disaster is near and the impending things are hastening upon them. Now it's this part in the song well, what happens is that within the, the Hebrew text that Moses moves from using verbs that are in the imperfect aspect to the perfect aspect. Which you're wondering, why am I telling you this? What does this mean? <laughs> well, up to this point, what he's talking about is things that are already completed actions. It's like, this is how things are. They're already this way. But now what he's switching to is these are things that are incomplete. Uh, these are things that aren't totally done yet. So you read about God's vengeance. It's not totally done yet. His retribution isn't complete. And he says they're impending things and they are hastening upon them. So they're things that are in progress that are going to be completed in the future. Now... Where can you think of in Scripture that you hear this phrase, vengeance is mine? Yeah, in Romans chapter 12, where Paul's talking about you know, living at peace with all men, whether it be governing leaders, you know, other Christians who have different you know, opinions on conscience matters, uh, but in particular, in thinking forward to, you know, unjust nations, unjust government. He says, well, how do you respond to that? Paul says, well, never taking your own revenge, beloved. Instead, leave room for the wrath of God, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. God's not done with his judgment. This isn't something that he just completed in the past. 
says so it's incomplete and it's going to be finished in, in the future. So he's seeing, you know, this section in Deuteronomy 32 is still to be fulfilled in the future from the standpoint of writing in Romans chapter 12. But that vengeance isn't just for those other people. It's also quoted in Hebrews 10.30. It says, For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. You probably think of that sort of concept in 1 Peter. It's, you know, judgment, it, it, it starts with God's household. He deals with his own people first, but then he doesn't exempt other, other people from it. You know, everybody gets judged without partiality. And then there's that other phrase there that's not uh, a Bible quote but you might remember it from a famous sermon in due time their foot shall slide who preached on that text yeah Jonathan Edwards uh, most famous theologian of the English language, I suppose, commenting on this text from sinners in the hands of an angry God. I'll read you a, a quote. He says, The God that holds you over the pit of hell, much as one holds a spider or some loathsome insect over the fire, abhors you and is dreadfully provoked. His wrath towards you burns like fire. He looks upon you as worthy of nothing else but to be cast into the fire. He is of purer eyes than to bear to have you in his sight. You were ten thousand times you were ten thousand times more abominable in his eyes than the most hateful, venomous serpent is in ours. You have offended him infinitely more than ever a stubborn rebel did his prince, and yet it is nothing but his hand that holds you from falling into the fire every moment. It is to be ascribed to nothing else that you did not go to hell last night, that you was suffered to wake again in this world after you closed your eyes to sleep, and there is no other reason to be given. Why, you have not dropped into hell since you arose in the morning, but that God's hand has held you up. There is no other reason to be given why you have not gone to hell since you have sat here in the house of God provoking his pure eyes by your sinful, wicked manner of attending his solemn worship. Yea, there is nothing else that is to be given as a reason why you do not this very moment drop down into hell. End quote. Jonathan Edwards also learned the song of Deuteronomy. 32 and uh, taught it and applied it very appropriately. God, as we read, has a judgment not just for Israel, but for all nations and the nations who would curse Israel. Remember what he had promised to Abraham, I will curse those who curse you. You pick up in verse 39, see now that I, I am he, and there is no God besides me. That's where Isaiah picks up on that later. It says, it is I who put to death and give life. I have wounded, and it is I who heal, and there is no one who can deliver from my hand. Now, something I want to point out here is uh, God has no problem with saying that he brings about death or wounding people. He doesn't say, I allowed some people to die, or I allowed some people to be wounded, but then I healed them after I just watched it happen while I was sitting by. But God, God is bigger than that. Uh, you, you will never read a verse in your Bible where it says, God allowed something like this to happen. It, he has no problem in taking responsibility for these things. He says, I have wounded, and it is I who heal. Like, well, why, why is that? Why do I make a big deal about this every now and then? 
Well, it, one, because this is how God has revealed himself, and we should speak about him the way that he has revealed himself. Also, I think it brings a greater comfort to our souls because uh, we, we realize that we're not, we're not wounded by chance. We're not wounded by happenstance or God just like turned his back for a minute. But there's actually, there's a purposeful wounding that comes at, at his hand, which to be sure it's an affliction, but it's not condemnation when he afflicts us as his people. But it's in order to turn us back to him, to remind us of his faithfulness, to remind us of his trustworthiness. It's always purposeful. So there's not just meaningless wounding in the world, meaningless suffering. It's always meaningful. It's always purposeful. And it's at the hand of God, which you have to remember the other side of it. He says, and it is I who heal. But how, how can you know that he heals unless he's the one who wounds you? How, how could you know that he's merciful unless you knew something about his wrath? You know, God, God has done these things in his goodness and in his wisdom. And just because we perceive something as painful, we don't say, well, that's bad and God is good, so therefore he couldn't have done this. And say, well, it's not bad, it's a good thing that he's done to us. And his ways are higher than, than ours and he has some things in his toolbox, which includes suffering in order to work on us and to instruct us and to teach us and to guide us so we can take comfort in that. But he also says that there's no one who can deliver from my hand. You, you can't deliver yourself. Well, if you think, well, maybe, maybe Egypt could deliver us. Maybe a partnership with Assyria would deliver us. Uh, maybe some like sort of political alliances, if we could just maneuver it right, uh, then that would change these prophecies about exile and we could get restoration another way. Now, Israel tried that, but God says, there's none who can deliver from my hand. Uh, things have to work out in history the, the way exactly how God has ordained it, which is also a good thing. Uh, though you may live through all sorts of difficulties, you see everything's moving forward according to plan. We don't see suffering and go, oh, the, the plan got messed up. It's like, no, this is according to plan. This is also working according to the counsel of his will. And so recognizing that God ordains all things that happen in his creation is a comfort. And he's not looking to us to provide some sort of apology for making statements like this and to say, well, you know, God just allowed it and we just want to save him from seeming like he's responsible for evil. Well, we know, one, he's, he's not morally responsible for evil, that he is good and that he does these things. This is how he talks about himself. So there's some theology and, and, and comfort for your soul. <laughs> when you look at verse 43, it says, Oh, nations causes people to shout for joy. Well, how, how do the nations cause his people, that's Israel, to, to shout for joy? Well, it's when they're judged. Think about the book of Revelation here. That's when these things happen. It says, For he will avenge the blood of his slaves, and he will render vengeance on his adversaries, and he will atone for his land and his people. I listen to that. Some people say, well, he didn't really mean land. Land's just another word for people. They're two different words. <laughs> yeah, and they mean what they mean. Uh, God will atone for his land and his people. Uh, he will, uh, you know, another way that word atone is used is to dedicate. You know, he'll, he'll dedicate that land which he promised for the purpose that he has intended and his people for the pur purpose that he has attended within that place. Uh, the people and the place and what they're to be dedicated to will happen through God atoning for both of them. And you've probably heard me use this 
phrase before, but I talk about God's salvation. It's a salvation through judgment. You know, salvation isn't just this idea of escaping something. Uh, salvation is through judgment. Maybe that's most clear in your mind when you think about the cross. How did salvation come to us? Through judgment. And it was God's judgment coming upon the Son. Well, it, it works that way throughout history in all sorts of other aspects, but you see that even in the last days when God carries out his judgment on all of his people's enemies. How does salvation come? Judgment of all of Israel's enemies, which we've talked about this in the uh, development of Scripture. When the, I, I refer to it as the three exoduses. And they, on the first one, God takes the people out of Egypt. But the problem is, is that Egypt's still inside of the people. So on the second one, you know, this is, you might remember the transfiguration of Jesus and Moses and Elijah are there. And it says they were talking about his exodus. That's the Greek word used there, or his departure. And, and it was looking forward to the, what he would do in his first coming, the cross, that was about, the, but also the second coming. You know, the cross wasn't going to be the last thing. It's a two-stage sort of exodus event. And so what Christ does in his work on the cross when the Passover meal develops into the Lord's Supper and he ratifies the new covenant in his blood, he takes Egypt out of the people. He gives them new hearts. So you have people out of Egypt, then you have Egypt out of the people, but there's still one more thing to be dealt with. That's Egypt. They're still Egyptians. They're still enemies. That's the third exodus. That's what's celebrated in the marriage supper of the Lamb when God takes Egypt out of Egypt. No more enemies. And his salvation plan is complete, you know, revolving around those three Lamb suppers, those three exoduses, if you, if you will. This text, I think as you heard, you know, there's no God besides me. It's just a reminder. There's only one God. Israel had the hardest time learning this. And I think about when, you, when they came out of Egypt, they're like, what do you mean there's one God? <laughs> there's, there's a ton of them. We know of all sorts of other ones, and we really like them. I think we'll probably that, that hits home a little bit more with us as we think about this past Sunday's message I see, you, you, you can't mix Christianity and psychology. I say, like, what do, you, what do you mean you can't do that? Why, why can't we mix, like, their Bible and their apostles and their religion and their salvation and their terms for sin and their terms for salvation? Why can't we mix them? I think that's probably where we see the, the struggle more so in our modern day. There's these things that we, it's like, this is just what it's like. This is the world we live in. This is how people talk and, and think. What do you mean that we have to leave that stuff and just only take, only have God's Bible direct us in how to speak? Only have God's Word label our problems and explain the solution? How can you say that the Bible's the only thing? How can you say that there's no God besides Him? Well, when God judges all those uh, opposed to him, he atones for his land, for his people, which again, that whole section there is things that are incomplete. There are things to be completed in the future. And that's even from the standpoint of Paul. He, he follows the logic of uh, chapter 32 here, even as he comes to the end of Romans and he quotes verse 43 in Romans 15, 10. He says, and again, rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. Which is what you read. O nations, cause his people to shout for joy. He's referring back to that there in Deuteronomy 32. And we need to see how that 
progresses in the future, even from our standpoint. If you look at Revelation 6.10, I'll go there first. So I'm going to start at 6 9. This is within the, the opening of the seven seals. Revelation 6 9. And when he opened the fifth seal, I saw underneath the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and because of the witness which they had maintained. And they cried out with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Master, holy and true? Will you not judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? So they're, they're, they're praying Deuteronomy 32, and they're saying, Oh God, will you not do that? Which they know that he will. They're not questioning him. But they're, they're when is the time? When are you finally going to take Egypt out of Egypt? When are you going to finally deal with all of our enemies? Move to Revelation 19. We're going to read the the hallelujah course here of these people having, these martyrs having their prayers answered. After these things, I heard something like a loud voice of a great crowd in heaven saying, hallelujah, salvation and glory and power belong to our God because his judgments are true and righteous for He has judged the great harlot who was corrupting the earth with her sexual immorality, and he has avenged the blood of his slaves shed by her hand. You can hear that connecting back into what we just read toward the end of Deuteronomy 32. This is when it finally happens, and they sing the hallelujah. It says, the second time they said hallelujah, her smoke rises up forever and ever. And the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshiped God who sits on the throne saying, Amen, hallelujah. And a voice came from the throne saying, Give praise to our God, all you his slaves. You can hear the Exodus language in that and it's connected back to the song of Moses back in Exodus, which is a much more triumphant song than Deuteronomy 32. Deuteronomy 32 is like very much prosecuting Israel. It's not so victorious for them. But going back to uh, the song of Moses and Exodus of God's slaves being made free. It gives praise to our God, all you slaves, you who fear him, the small and the great. Then I heard something like, the voice of a great crowd and like the sound of many waters and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder saying, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give the glory to him for the marriage supper of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. That's what that song that Moses wrote so long ago is looking forward to is this finally happening. And it's amazing to think about how when we read something like Deuteronomy 32 that it's still yet to be fulfilled, even from our standpoint. And we can read of its fulfillment and look forward to God certainly doing this, the God who wounds and who will heal who will keep his covenants to his people, to the land, and will do exactly what he promised to do because our rock is faithful. Let's pray. Our gracious Lord, you are our rock. You're the one who protects us, who protects us from your judgment against our sin. Let you do that through Christ who is our rock, the foundation we stand on, the refuge and hiding place in which we are covered, which we are forgiven, by which we escape your wrath, by which we are atoned for 
in which we find satisfaction for the penalty that is due us, in which we find the provision of living waters in a cross, which was a tree that was turned into a tree that gives life of all those who would partake of the blood and the body of Christ as he ratified the new covenant in his own blood. We thank you for being those who have been brought into that covenant of reconciliation to be ambassadors of it, to proclaim to others to be reconciled in you and to proclaim still your coming judgment and to still have that certain hope that you'll make all things right, that you will do away with all enemies in the land as well as its thorns and thistles, that all of the curse will be done away with, that you will renew this fallen world and make it a new heavens and a new earth with a new people with new hearts, that the culmination will definitely be consummated into your rest to all know you and to all enjoy you forever and ever. And your judgments are true. They are righteous. You will carry out vengeance and make recompense for all that was lost. For you are the God of salvation through judgment. And we praise you and pray that you would increase our love of you, increase our steadfastness in you, increase our placing our hope in you and you alone, the rock who still guides us even now and for all our days. You are faithful. Amen. Thank you.